So let's get started. Hi, I'm Ben Lewis, and I'm Morgan, and uh, we wanted to talk about home automation in a way that is a bit more security conscious than most of the options currently on the market. There's a lot of people that are talking about home automation, kind of having some questions as to whether or not it's secure, etc. Uh, turns out this is typically a, a good question to ask, and from a signal intelligence perspective, especially when you're trying to work on your own operational security, it can be really good to think about this. So, I, uh, I bike everywhere as much as I can, and uh, I do software stuff. Where isn't really important. <laughs> I'm a student, um, I'm gonna be graduating in May. Uh, I'm typically a shell jockey, sitting in front of a lot of uh, Machines over SSH. Uh, you can yell at me on Twitter. So, so home automation. Uh, home automation started out as simply making it easier to get things done, like cooking, because tending cooking fires sucks. So as soon as people found a way to automate this in some form or fashion, it took off like mad, because suddenly you have more free time to do things. You've got time to walk, like washing clothes takes less time, washing dishes takes less time. Most of early home automation was simply what we think of as standard appliances in a house now. Your refrigerator, your stove, your dishwasher, your washing machine. And now we're starting to get into the things that were a little more basic that people didn't initially think needed to be automated. So, big one. Automation has an interesting history. Um, a kind of interesting example is actually the Trojan Room coffee pot. Um, the, there's a webcam that somebody hooked up to a frame grabber or a little bit of software so that people could see what was going on at the coffee machine because the coffee machine was always out of coffee. What year yeah. was that? You know? uh, 90, early 90s. 93-ish? Yeah. And this then turned into a joke of the hypertext coffee, uh, coffee pot control protocol because I can never get that right. Um, this was an April Fool's RFC that has then seen some actual implementations, including teapots that will respond with an HTTP 418, I'm a teapot response. Um, and then we get in, so now we're, we're getting past the, the jokes and into actual home automation that was actually used and is still used. So X10 is the earliest um, protocol driven uh, home automation system that was available. And it simply ran over power lines. So you'd plug a, a box about two packs of cards, large, into an outlet, and you'd use that as your control point. You'd plug one in where you want to turn on a light, for instance. And you had to be careful that you and your neighbors didn't both use the same house code because there was no encryption, there was no protection, there was just messages being sent by signaling on power lines. And there still isn't. Um, some people have found interesting and fun attacks against X10 because of people stringing out their like Christmas lights and stuff. And, and they had the great idea to put it on the internet. <laughs> because your power lines should be on the internet. Always. And then we get into the wonderful world of how many standards can we cram into a small congested space? Um, <laughs> This next slide will explain a great deal. This is the 90s and early 2000s in terms of home automation options. So we have from more X10 to no, no, do not. One net was a mistake. Um, just not worth it. Um, to X10 again, but yeah. with RF now. Yeah, Insteon. Insteon is actually still available and is still quite popular. Uh, you have possibly heard of them. and. Basically, X10 keeps showing up because it was really popular. Um, and finally, we get into the more exciting side. Uh, Zigbee and Z-Wave <laughs> are really the ones that I want to talk about more. Because, so Zigbee is originally a sensor network. Uh, it's used in farming to determine moisture level in fields because it's just a mesh network of, of uh, moisture sensors that all speak RF and all send messages and they eventually report back to someone who cares. Um, standard for running IPv6 over it, so that all your IPv6 devices can also be over a low power mesh network. But, um, and then there's Z-Wave, which is just, it, it, it's, it's almost like Zigbee, but not quite. 
it's more like X10, but over RF. Um, but done well. Um, we'll get into that. Then we get into the smart home internet things. Um, where basically put Wi-Fi on it. Put Wi-Fi on your light bulbs. Put Wi-Fi on your, your, your uh, water heater, your, Everything. your stove, your fridge. Any object you can find, slap Wi-Fi on it. Why not? The what could go wrong? Point. The big tipping point was thermostats. Um, Nest being one of the big early ones. Um, because they were mostly the realm of like, well, that's just not what we want to touch. So now we also have things like um, personal AI with Cortana, Siri, et cetera, which is great if you want to like talking to robotic women on the internet. Um, but there are literally hundreds of devices now. Kickstarter is full of, let's put this thing on the internet, like your coffee pot. Or Android on fridges. You can find these in Home Depot or Lowe's today and try to use them and discover that somebody crashed it. Or hot water heaters on the internet because nothing could go wrong, right? Because, and the best part is when these go very wrong and say the service tips over. We'll get to that. But we'll come back to that. Um, at the end of it, three basic contenders have come out uh, through the fog of war, Zigbee, Z-Wave, and Insteon. These are the ones, this is what you'll find most of the time at Home Depot as your options. You've got Philips Hue, you've got um, Smart Things, Smart Things uh, a few other brands, and then Insteon has managed to slap their name on a whole bunch of products. Um, Zigbee, it's officially called IEEE 802154. It is a less than 10 milliwatt, low data rate, really simple, stupid uh, protocol, uh, originally for sensor networks. Uh, there's a couple of different systems. You can, you've probably seen XBs, which are essentially mesh serial for Arduino. Um, really, really stupid, simple setup. Same protocol, just different application. Uh, the official standard is called Zigbee Home Automation, or Light Link for uh, home stuff. And Hue, Ikea, and the Samsung SmartThings uh, bridges all use this protocol. Then we have Z-Wave. Uh, there's one primary uh, vendor of the actual radio itself. Uh, it's almost intended for home automation. It was originally intended for stage automation. Um, but it found a better home in the house. Uh, there's a bunch of different vendors, Wink, GE. Um, there is legitimately a website called zwaveproducts.com. They sell nothing but things that talk Z-Wave. Um, it's a, another mesh topology, just like Zigbee, uh, but it uses ISM bands, which are unlicensed, cheap bands, as opposed to the 2.4 gigahertz bands that Zigbee uses, which means you have to make sure that you get stuff that's built for your specific country region. And then we get to Insteon, uh, there's a couple of vendors. Um, it has a long history of home automation use. It's typically targeted at power devices, like your outlets. It's 99% a remote power switch. But uh, this means that you can swap it into the wall. You just take, take off the panel, swap, well, turn off the circuit, take off the panel, swap out the box, and you're good to go. Your switch can now sp speak Wi-Fi, well, speak an RF protocol. Everything has its problems, though. So, every, everything we've described here can be and has been attacked. This, does, this is mostly a matter of, so, this is mostly a matter of um, how broad is your attack surface? Are we dealing with simply someone who is near enough to be able to talk to your radios? Are we dealing with someone who is able to intercept traffic? Are we able to... Are, are we able to cut your internet and cut off access to devices? Are, you know, do, will your home stop heating because it can't reach a server? This has happened. This was, there have been multiple nest outages that were simply, we can't talk to the internet anymore, so we're not going to provide any heat. Um, That's a problem. There's devices like Belkin's Wemo system. They literally just took and said, cool, we've got Linux uh, on an embedded chip. Let's put that to control 110 volts AC. That sounds like nothing could go wrong. Um, most of the major hubs use out-of-home control. So it actually has to do a full pass out of the network back in to do anything. 
That's what hue looks like. In so, order to turn on a light from hue, you have to start from the outside, hit the edge of their API, go through a bunch of Google Cloud infrastructure, then it finally hits the bridge and turns on the light. And meanwhile, they are instrumenting all of this. So, so if you use there. so if you use one of these services, most likely they will keep track of when you turn on your lights, when you turn off your lights, what temperatures you set things to. And part of this is useful. Part of it allows you to optimize certain aspects of your house. Part of it also is their product research and whoever they sell that thing to, because some of them do sell it. Uh, there was an entire range of devices which recently announced that they would simply no longer provide service in Europe, thanks to GDPR. So your outlets are no longer smart. And as we said, Nest had a networking outage back in July 2016, where people's thermostats just stopped running. There was also the January outage, where people yep. stopped getting heat in the middle of the coldest winter on record on the eastern seaboard. Yep. Uh, uh, Reams Econet service for their uh, smart water heaters decided, why should we turn on water heaters? That sounds like a bad idea. In January. Um, the old original Hue firmware doesn't care whether or not it's signed or not. It just says, fuck it, let's dump this onto the flash and run it. Um, and then you have other failures like simply the entire graph of devices falling apart. So we ran around the house using one of these remotes and holding it up to every light that we had, we had set up and telling it to repair and then renaming it and then regrouping it. These things happen. But at least those are local failures and not distributed failures. So a lot of these RF networks and, a, and the power line networks need some sort of bridge to an ethernet uh, for non kind of push button control. Um, there's a couple of common ones for Zigbee. Uh, Philips's Hue platform is actually pretty extensible even for local control. Um, and the IKEA Chadfri kit goes to Ethernet. There's plenty of USB dongles. Uh, there's Raspberry Pi hats. Um, there's even a turn Zigbee devices into MQTT, and we'll get to that a little bit. Uh, Z-Wave, there's Ethernet bridges and USB dongles, and Insteon has a really cool USB or even like actual nine pin line level serial adapter. So, as for why we got into home automation, um, it started out with, it originally started out with I wanted better simulated presence when I'm on vacation. I wanted it to look like I was in my house the whole time. Um, since I'm no longer in a ground level apartment, I don't care about that as much, but it's still nice to be able to have lights dim automatically in the evening, have color temperature change over time. Um, and it's a really trivial way to improve my quality of life. Um, There's a really great example from a friend of ours who has this Y-shaped hallway where only two of the legs have switches, but the lights... Well, only two entries to the hallway have switches, and there's lights all around it, so if you get to the third prong of the hallway, you're left going, well, I want to turn off these lights now, but can't. So instead, he put in hue bulbs and is now able to just stick a plug anywhere he wants, or stick a, a switch anywhere he wants, which is especially useful in a condo where you don't really want to go rewiring it because then you have to deal with the condo board, mm -hmm. which sucks. Um, other things are being able to apply automation. Um, say you want to watch a movie and you want your lights to dim. Well, you can get up and do that automatically, or you can have your home automation system listen for a trigger from your TV saying that you're now watching a movie and automatically bring down the lights. Or, I'm going to bed, I'm turning off the light in my bedroom, all the rest of the lights in my house can just go off now. Thanks. Uh, we also want to know things like the environment outside, especially, or inside, so temperature, humidity, uh, air quality. Um, I'm asthmatic and I really want to control the fine particulates that are going through my lungs because more fine particulates equals mo less happy me. There's an inverse relation to this. So we want to be able to know that, but we also want to make sure that any data that's generated stays within our network as much as possible, because we vaguely trust that our network is mostly safe for our data. So we, we decided that you know we can start with lighting, and then we can see where we can go. Well, looking at the lighting options, there was 
Hugh is the big name. And Hugh has the problem of that slide that we showed a few slides ago of that entire graph being required to run Hugh. And then there was a new contender that showed up from IKEA called Trudfree. Now, this is an interesting solution because realistically, even though we've got this, this gateway right here, we don't need it. We could run everything just off of this remote. But adding the gateway allowed us to control it and monitor it from another system. So in terms of what Trudfree is, it's Zigbee-based. It, um, it is entirely a graph. Uh, There's an app. It's there, it has an Android app. It has an iOS app. The app is actually really nice. The app only works locally. It lets you um, set up things like timers and such. Uh, there's a couple of really cool features that it does that if you set up a home automation system outside of it, can be done on its own. But just having the gateway lets you do uh, a home and away settings uh, and a couple of other like basic presence detection type scenarios that are very simple and very straightforward to set up. And again, completely in network. There's no uh, talking to IKEA's system. Other than IKEA, to check for updates. Yes, yeah, because IKEA didn't run, run, run our service. That sounds like energy and effort. So this was a perfectly reasonable point to stop. If, if you want to just automate lighting, I can strongly recommend Trudfree and not going further than Trudfree. And actually, this is set up right now, so we can just you know turn on light and play with color temperature a bit. There is another possible end stop. Uh, GE has a whole set of life and sleep under their uh, C by GE brand. They have a bridge that you can do out of network control with, but the idea behind life and sleep is that they change color temperature over time um, and handle the differences that people want in their lighting. OK, so we, we said we'd talk about MQTT earlier. It is, I always, get be useful. I, I always get the phrasing wrong, so I'm going to read from the slide here. Message queue telemetry transport. Um, it's fancy pub sub. It's really, it's you publish two topics, which are strings that you declare, and other people, other systems can listen to those, can subscribe to those topics. There's some, you know, there, there's message gar lifetime guarantees. There's things that you want from a pub sub system, but ultimately it's just a way to receive strings from devices that produce strings. And it's used everywhere. If you use uh, uh, Facebook Messenger, you are actually running MQTT back and forth to Facebook systems so that they can get information from your device at a very slow rate, but also do pretty quick updates. Um, Azure's AOT, IoT system, uh, the AWS IoT system. Um, Anybody's yeah. IoT service. Every, every cloud vendor has an IoT service now to, to take your sensors that are out in the world and connect them to their cloud. And they it's all, all MQTT. Talk MQTT. Um, and then Node-RED, which is an interesting graph. It, it's a, a very graphical um, uh, it's a flow home automation diagram. or IoT service. If you've ever seen LabVIEW, uh, it'll look really simple, but it's an information flow graph. An event starts a thing, and it walks its way through the graph. But now we have another problem. There's more standards, and da. Ah. So we decided to go with something simple called Home, Home Assistant. Assistant. Uh, Home Assistant is a Python-based um, home automation control center, gateway, call it what you will. It um, binds all of them together, like it, the one ring. The, the, the great thing about it is, since it's Python-based and lots of these home automation kits are available as Python modules, people have found ways to connect absolutely anything to it that they, can, that they care to. Uh, I recently found out that there's a Travis CI integration, so you can use Travis CI to you know, automate a build, and then you could turn a, a light bulb a different color if your build failed. Um, we've got Home Assistant running on this Raspi here to uh, provide a, our, to, to uh, it's run a simple setup. give us a, a little extra control over our trud free setup yeah. that we're presenting. So there's some other options. Um, because Home Assistant has built on a bunch of Python uh, libraries, you could go and implement your own version. You could use cron and Python and do all this yourself. Um, 
OpenHAB is a giant, is a larger Java application. It's older and somewhat more mature, by a factor of like four or five years. Um, it has some similar features, but it's all written in Java, and you have to have a very specific setup. But it does support the oh, I feel like running it on my Windows Server machine because they have integration for that. There's a couple of things where um, Home Assistant would need a bridge. Uh, OpenHAB can do that just by, oh, look, there's the serial port. Um, installing Home Assistant is pretty straightforward. There's a couple options. Um, we've, we've, we've gone for Haspian um, because Docker sounded a little too complicated to run on Raspberry Pi quite frankly. And neither of us have particular experience with Docker, but like, if you're comfortable with Docker, like, I hope you like containers. Running your own doc Docker maintenance is like the best I hear. Um, but if you're one of those like old school Unix uh, gray beard badasses that likes handling everything by hand, you can just throw this into pip. Like, it will happily live in its own little virtual environment that you just bake up for it, spawn it, and run it, and we'll go, okay, cool, I'm doing my own thing now. Uh, so Home Assistant's got a few ways to configure. You can uh, allow it to auto-discover devices on its own. You can allow it, you can um, define specific configurations. It uses a, a lot of YAML as its configuration. Um, you will get very good at laying things out in YAML. Q and Trodfree are pretty consistently found early on in its uh, wake up. Um, there is some assembly required. Um, Trodfree and a couple others need some shell use to. You'll, you'll need to install those. stuff from pip. Yeah. You will need to pull down extra dependencies. So this Has is a little more hands on. Haspian does include a certain amount of helper scripts. You'll have to SSH and run the helper script. Um, their Docker-based system is completely automated. It goes, oh yeah, I need that, and that, and that, and that, and hey, I'm good. Um, some of them do require human input for authentication. So we've got a Plex server at home, and uh, our, our home, home assistant setup actually has Plex integration now, so it can tell if you're watching stuff. Uh, but that required adding an API key to home assistant that had to be done by, you know, you can't do that automatically. That required manual inter uh, interaction. Similarly, getting the gateway to connect required getting the code that is on the back of that into Home Assistant. I think it's like base 36 of the, uh, of the MAC address. So you could determine it, but it is actually a certain level of like, go read this thing off of the bottom of the device. Um, this is somewhat uncommon. Home kit devices require this. But it's still a little more uncommon than I'd like it to be. Um, and if you want to do MQTT, there's a little bit of setup that you've got to do to make sure that it has all the dependencies and, uh, and all the pieces lined up. A lot of stuff gets installed automatically when you just add it to your, um, to your configuration. But some things you have to go and actually install a package in Debian. Um, we have a very different configuration style, so we're, we'll show you in a second. Uh, we make use of the various include directives, and we have a lot of the basic default components. Um, but a lot of people just layer on custom components, tweak the UI. Uh, there's a new UI that they're testing called Loveless, which is a fully decoupled UI, which is really cool, unless you do anything you want. Custom interfaces for everything, just define it as a template. Our configuration um, is built around a bunch of includes. Uh, if you've seen anybody who works on Debian, you'll know what this looks like. So we have a directory that just contains our automizations, our customizations, lights, grouping, etc. Um, this is what our configuration looks like on the inside. Uh, so we grab stuff from the uh, from dark sky for our weather. Uh, we have kept secret a an API key, which is stored in another file separately, so that you can keep that out of like your continuous integration setups or your Git repos if you're using that. There are, by the way, people who take and make it so that if they change something on GitHub, Travis runs it, checks to make sure that it's valid and then automatically 
uh, pushes it to their home home automation setup, and it reboots the box, and whatever put you know pull requests that somebody said, oh yeah, you should do this, gets like automatically dropped right on their on their house. It's pretty freaking weird, but at the same time, it's a whole lot of trust in the internet. Um, but you can keep your secret secret, um, even from, to a certain degree, Home Assistant. The configuration that we have for the demo is pretty basic. It has some, uh, all the external integrations turned off. There is a cloud integration that they offer to make um, Alexa or Google Home integration just a little bit nicer because both Alexa and Google Home require an external uh, API surface on the public routable internet, which is a little bit scary. Um, but it's a bare minimum quality of life adjustment. Um, we talked about a lot of these, but there are a lot of different lighting standards. Um, Zigbee, uh, LiFX and Yeelight are literally just let's talk to it over TCP. Um, Yeelight is the one that said, oh, GDPR is here. Sorry, Europe, you don't get any, uh, any lights. Um, then, like, people put their lights on MQTT. It's pub sub for your light bulbs. <laughs> some stuff. Still there. Yeah. Uh, some stuff you should know about lights. Lights are gauged for color temperature. Um, this is measured in degrees Kelvin, just like stars. Um, warm is actually a blue or white color, so this so is a middling uh, color. So, yeah, this, this is actually a, a relatively cold color temperature. Uh, and we'll, light right now. We'll see and it. And we can it's being make it lower. more red. Um, humans use uh, color temperature to gauge the circadian rhythm. Um, we want to go to bed when, red, when light is red because that's the color of the horizon. That means the sun is setting. We want to be awake when the sky is blue or white because that's when the day is happening. So if you constantly flood your life with blue light, you will hate yourself. Sleep will be terrible. You will just absolutely destroy any sort of circadian rhythm you have. Um, there's a couple of different kinds of lights. Uh, LEDs are cheap. CFLs were the big thing, like, well, 10 years ago? Even up to five years ago. Um, and incandescent is still around, and there's even there's new, more efficient incandescent bulbs right now. That's why they haven't died out completely. But the old standard, just say vacuum and tungsten getting super hot, yeah, that's more or less gone. Um, we still, uh, there's a couple of different kinds of sockets. Um, Edison sockets are which are most useful, uh, used to. Uh, this is an E14, it's a 14 millimeter screw thread. E26 is the most common. You've seen them everywhere. You have them in your house, guaranteed. Yep. Um, and then there's the GX24Q, which we discovered when I broke a light bulb and trying to change it in the apartment. Um, they are because a square pre-ballasted CFL. So instead of having the ballast in the body like most normal CFLs, they put the ballast in the ceiling outside of the realm. They're a pain in the ass to find. If you have them, replace them with, with just Edison sockets. They are so much nicer. Um, a lot of over-counter lighting uses GU10 and GU24 lights which are these um, little pegs that come out and you twist them in. Yeah. See those in that blue light in the bottom. Yeah. So here's color temperature. Um, so what we're seeing is um, color temperature going up and down. The perceived color and the actual spectrum of light that is produced by something which has that color temperature. As you can see, as we get hotter, we get closer to blue, but as we get colder, we come out closer to infrared. Um, one other thing is sensors. Sensors are how uh, data is brought into the network. Um, there's a lot of different types. Um, Zigbee is one of them. So this is a sensor. They, this, it's a, it's a sensor of a sort. It, um, it also, in IKEA's implementation, operates as the pairing device. Um, so this is how you bring a new Zigbee device into the graph, just by holding down its pairing button and 
button and holding it close to a device. Yep. Um, Z-Wave has a whole selection of sensors, like door sensors, motion detectors, etc. Um, the other cool part is that you can build your own sensors. It's really straightforward. If you are comfortable building a couple of uh, lines of uh, stuff for Arduino, or even um, building a couple of lines of uh, YAML, you could uh, do this. There is a Z-Wave sensor uh, kit that some people have built, but it's expensive. Um, some last little tidbits for uh, a lot of the home automation stuff. Um, most things can be, that can be controlled are called switches because this is the analog for a physical wall switch. Um, voice assistant varies. Um, you need to have publicly facing instances or some bridge to the outside world. Um, and you are gonna have to choose how much infrastructure you wanna wor work with and you wanna maintain versus what you wanna let other people maintain. Uh, so, and on the topic of letting other people maintain your infrastructure, then you get into walled gardens. Um, the most common, the, the uh, biggest example of this is Hue. Uh, Philips, when they introduced Hue, came out with the Works with Hue program that allowed people, other companies, to make components that would work with it. They could make bulbs that could interact, or switches, or pretty much any object that they wanted to have speak Zigbee, they could, and it could work with Hue, until Philips decided that that was actually too much work and did not make them enough money. So they pushed out an update that killed works with Hue. And suddenly all of your GE light bulbs that worked with Hue didn't work with Hue anymore. And they had people reverting the, the update to their hubs. They had people blocking their hubs from the internet. And... Um, generally had a PR disaster on their hands for attempting this. Um, the more hacker friendly you get, the more fidelity you get. Uh, <clears throat> um, the most uh, hacker friendly are like Decon Z, Zigbee to MQTT. These are things which are building off of really low cost hardware to try and produce as much high fidelity information about sensor data coming in and to be able to have the highest amount of control of the devices on the network. Um, consider the options that you want and how much you actually want the automation system to do it for you. Um, ultimately, this is about how much time and frustration you want to have to put in to get out of it. There's also a sense of ownership, Yeah. Um, ultimately. Uh, let's talk about external data sources. So there's a lot of open data APIs out there. Um, being out here, the... Uh, King County Transit and Seattle Department of Transportation have um, time to get from point A to point B calculations and common travel times across certain spans of uh, the highways. They provide that as an API. That's available to Home Assistant and anybody. You just have to get your own API key. They hand them out for free. Uh, similarly, there's a program that gets uh, bike share data. And load and makes it available over an API. So I don't know if Seattle's is in integrated into this, or if uh, Limebike or any of those are integrated. But there are programs that can tell you, hey, there are some bike share bikes available within a certain radius of your apartment or your house. So let's actually look at what uh, Home Assistant looks like. So. This is Home Assistant running through its web interface. Uh, right now, we have a remote control, which just simply shows its battery uh, status. These run off of CR2032s, so you can have these things run for years without ever touching them. Um, there's a group defined by Trodfree, and this is a light and with its name. And then this over here is an adjustment that lets us see um, the color temperature over time. And it doesn't really have any tunables, unfortunately. Um, but I can look at a light, and I can change brightness, color temperature, all independently. Um, on RGB bulbs, you can, you can just change the color. 
Um, all of these can be automated uh, through the automation interface. Um, just for fun, I have the, uh, this is just, this is just what's running it's on up. the Pi there. So we have, so this is the Home Assistant configuration uh, directory. And this is the config. It's pretty straightforward. The only thing that we actually had to change was latitude and longitude, uh, the time zone, elevation, and that's used for uh, sunrise and sunset calculations. And I had to set up, this is how you set up the color temperature. How many people here use uh, F-Lux on their computer? To, uh, yeah, you, you yeah. or turn on the night light mode in Windows 10? Yeah, so this is the exact same thing, but for the color temperature of the lights in your house or apartment. And We've got that turned on for all of the lights in our main room. Yeah. So as the day progresses and it hits sunset, the color, the color temperature shifts so that it's more and more red. Is until it easier to override? You can just turn off. If you need to override it, I can just come over here and say, I don't need that right now. And, and you can set up entire configurations. You could have different modes. Like one thing that I'm looking at for uh, the apartment is an entertaining mode, where it turns off some of these these uh, configurations, so that we've got if we've got people over and I have the light on in the bedroom and I turn it off, it doesn't plunge everybody into darkness. Yeah. Um, one second, like my wife likes to, you know, she likes to embroider. Right. And she needs a lot of good light. For right. And, like, nope, do it in the dark. and you can have, yeah, and you can have like uh, a work light not monitored by flux. Yeah, so, yeah. so if you in look our here, configuration, we specifically have the light that we are monitoring, and you can just turn, just you can have multiple even. assign a group of lights to this yeah. or not. You could have multiple um, uh, flux light controls. So you could have one that's just for your front room, but then you have one for the upstairs, or one for the basement. Because, yeah, in the bedroom and our entertainment room. Yeah, you want mostly right. light. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You want nice, bright light. Yeah. And you want it right here. Yeah. So, yes, you can absolutely control how many lights get this, which lights get it. And there's... There's a, a, a guy on YouTube who has been documenting a lot of his stuff. And he's built his whole apartment around Home Assistant, it knows when he shows up, and so it turns on the lights. It knows that he's turning on uh, his Xbox, so it sets the lights to a particular thing, a particular setting, or it sets going, oh, I know that you're turning on a movie via Netflix, via Roku, and dims all of the lights and sets the, light, uh, the backlight red, or any number of options. These are uh, done through a, uh, a side effect of all the home automation stuff coming from stage work, uh, setting a scene. Um, scenes to home assistant and a lot of other stuff is just take a particular set of states and mash them into one. We can see that if we go down to the states view, we can see the state that each thing is in. You can also uh, call specific services within Home Assistant. So a service might be an automation being turned on or off or triggered. Um, you can ask Home Assistant to check its configuration. Um, so let's say turn off a light, and that's what it's actually passing internally, the light turns off. You can integrate a whole bunch of your own stuff into Home Assistant. It provides a, a WebSocket interface and an HTTP interface with authentication. It supports HTTPS. There's guides on how to set it up with Let's Encrypt if you want to hit it out from the outside world. I know a lot of people that do this. And if you want to 
modify its state internally. So all of these, the, the trud-free integration, the hue integration, these are all provided by components. And components are just Python packages that modify trud for, uh, home assistance internal state directly. So uh, their API see, is semi-documented. When you see um, this, what you are actually seeing is a little piece of... Um, Are you going to be able to hit the internet with your... Yes, drink? I should. Okay. I'm over Wi-Fi. Okay. Um, oh, yep. Nope. Um, um, there's a little piece of Python that just gets called and says, oh, it's time for me to update my timer, update the color temperature. You can, on the, uh, the documentation page for it, it gives you a link to the source in GitHub to say, oh, that's how it's doing it internally if you really want to know. So, next up, um, for devices that don't have any current smarts, there's you a whole can, bunch of different ways. You can, if it's simply a matter of turning it on and off, you can buy a switch like this. These are made by a company called ITED. Uh, or Sonoff. Um, this has an ESP8266 in it. They have their own app for it, but they leave the programming header pins on it. Well, they, they, leave, the, uh, they leave sockets to, to insert some pins for, for uh, programming. This is sort of the, we, we've gone past the just plug it in and the write some code to you're going to need a soldering iron and uh, to be willing to uh, flash a device and possibly brick it. Um, but fundamentally, they did all the hardware work, which is the hard part, um, and now you can build all the software on top of it beside all of their software. Uh, one of the easiest ways to do this is called ESP Home Lib, which is interfaced through uh, ESP Home YAML. Um, uses some YAML declarations to define the, f uh, the kind of device that you've got. It's built off of a system called Platform IO, which is a fairly straightforward, generic um, uh, microcontroller development platform. Uh, it's originally intended to keep people from having to have six different kinds of ARM tool chains all lined up. Um, it handles all the fun magic of how do you get uh, your memory layout, how you get it programmed. It has all the linker scripts. It has all the fun stuff. Um, but it also means you can CI deliver your light switches. Because yeah. you want to. Um, Deep you down, you want to. You, you, you know you want uh, Jenkins to just go, hey, you changed the configuration. Time to reflash your, uh, uh, your home fan. Does, so, does it turn red if your bill fails? It can. <laughs> it can. Well, you'd probably want a different light to turn red okay. if that build fails. You mostly want that one to tell you that it's connected to the network or whatever. Um, and ESP Home Live and ESP Home YAML are open source, I believe GPL. Uh, they're astoundingly easy to get uh, used to. Um, and uh, then th th this gets into our stack. So our stack at home looks like this. Um, we, we mostly are routing on through Home Assistant. Um, I'm working on some MQTT work uh, components for it. And really, it's all just 110 yeah. VAC and 18 gauge wire. Yeah. Um, so let's look at what the uh, Sonoff switch needs to configure. So, so this is uh, ESP Home YAML. So I have. Uh, our declaration of what device we're talking to. It's an ESP8266. Um, this is the specific model type. It's got one megabyte of uh, flash. It's effectively an ESP01 module. Um, our Wi-Fi configuration for the demo. Um, the MQTT broker, uh, which runs on uh, the Home Assistant setup. Um, it's got some data logging built in. It's also got some debug logging over serial. 
Uh, you can do OTA updates. If it can figure out how to touch your device, then you should be absolutely golden. There are, there are several um, pre-baked uh, home automation packages for this chipset, and most of them include the option to reflash themselves via a web interface because you want that clearly. Um, in this case, this is literally copy pasted out of the ESP Home YAML uh, documentation. Um, this is the binary sensor, which is the button on the front, um, and also a status uh, indicator. We have a switch that goes to a specific GPIO pin. Uh, it's got a name. And then there's what does it do when it's told to turn on? Yep. So there's an output of an LED, and that output gets talked to via a light. So uh, down here, um, you can see this is me actually compiling it. Um, you just call ESP Home YAML living room and run. It goes and it downloads all the libraries that it needs, all the compiler, linker, etc. The whole tool chain gets all the libraries, comes along, double checks that uh, it can actually fit it into the flash available, and does an upload. Um, uploads. Here's another upload. Um, and then it actually tries to make sure that everything's cool. It goes through first boot. It checks that it can connect to the, uh, uh, the Wi-Fi network, that it can get to MQTT, set up its MQTT topics, and I push the button a couple of times, and it tells me, hey, I send uh, that the state happened. So, basically, home automation is all about is about making your life more convenient and then staying out of your way. Um, or at least that's the, the golden ideal. Uh, mostly what we've found is that home automation then turns it into a bit of a pet that demands attention and time and more time and time. Um, Once you have uh, it all set up, though, it's mostly hands-off. So it's... There, there's all sorts of levels of how involved you want to get. You can, you can stop at just light bulbs. It's fine. Light bulbs will make your life better. That's why everybody works on them first, because they are a simple, easy win for just productivity and quality of life. Then you can start right, you know, you can start setting up a, a Raspberry Pi. You can go further and start writing code. You can get to the point of soldering components together because you want something that nobody else has built for you. All of these are just levels of complexity. And at any point, it's possible to stop and still have a very useful setup. And there are still things on the outside world that despite what you fucking think, will go, hey, yeah, we need to talk to the internet. And you're like, why did you need to go out of my house to turn on a light? But hopefully we can fix that. Step by step. Step by step. So, at the end of this, any uh, questions? So for a home assistant, um, so are there any limitations for taking input? Like let's say, if there's like a magnetic sensor on the door or something, you want to take that input and get it that? That's, there's a bunch that are already supported. Um, yeah, so there are a bunch that are already supported. Um, it's, it's really just a matter of finding a sensor that, having a gateway for that sensor. Uh, most of the door sensors that I've found are Z-Wave, and I have not yet found a Z-Wave gateway that I want to use. There's a fairly expensive Raspberry Pi. There, there's a USB module. There's a, a uh, Pi hat, and there's the Wink Hub. And of the three, the Wink Hub is the cheapest, but has the issue of wanting to talk to Wink servers. So, For reference, um, the base trod-free set, which comes with two E26... Uh, color, temperature, uh, changing lights, a hub, and a remote costs about 80 bucks. Um, the, the USB Z-Wave dongle also costs about 80 bucks. So... With no outputs. <laughs> right. Um, fundamentally, Z-Wave and Insteon are more expensive, but they give you more control. This is a level of control thing. 
Um, if you want to build your own sensors, um, ESP Homelib provides a really good base framework for generating values, um, especially Boolean and uh, basic integer values are like its thing. Um, the other thing is you can totally just talk MQTT directly to a home assistant. If you've got, already got something that's built around MQTT or that you already have the sensor framework, there's a bunch of things that's like, oh yeah, I need to add MQTT to this. Dribble it on top with a, an ESPD266 or with the Arduino Ethernet shield or a whole bunch of other options. Um, there are a lot of ESPD266 devices that are stupid cheap. Um, the D1 Mini is a little dual inline package, slap it onto a breadboard, uh, feed it five volts, and it's happy sort of uh, de device. And it's well supported by uh, the platform IO platform, so you are totally free to throw ESP Home Lib on top of it and go, oh, I need that funky door sensor that's weird. Um, if you have an existing alarm system, there's an integration point for uh, a thing called Alarm Decoder, which allows for a piece of hardware, it's what's on a Raspberry Pi, which talks to a uh, home alarm system and can read door sensors and fire alarms and start the sirens and do all that kind of fun stuff. So the cheapest entry is probably this setup uh, and ESPD266 devices. Um, the more expensive, the more kind of easy bake oven it turns into. It is very much a how much time are you going to put in to getting the hardware and making it run in the first place. If you just want the lights to turn on when you walk in the room, there's even cheaper setups than this. Um, IKEA sells a bulb and a uh, PIR sensor that you stick in and they use double-sided sticky tape to hold the PIR sensor. It runs off a of CR2032 for months at a time. It is you never have to worry about it. It is basically the remote, but it does PIR to say turn on and turn off. So you had a question back there, too. Other than maybe a Stuxnet, what are some of the high-profile So there was the Shmook on Z-Wave. Mirai attacked a lot of ARM devices that were on the public internet. Um, ShmooCon, uh, a couple years ago, they had the Z-Wave attack where they were able to pop door locks um, using a vulnerable version of, I think it was a Kingston door lock that was just, they didn't think about anybody coming up to it and blasting a high uh, power RF at it and trying to get it to factory reset and unlock. Um, generally speaking, we do not recommend putting your locks on this network. There are, you know, since that your door is opening, do not try to unlock your door for you. Unless you are willing to do things like, there's a fantastic uh, door lock that um, I've seen that uses a pin pad on the outside, but the way that it detects on the inside being uh, locked or unlocked is just a, a leaf switch, and you can override that leaf switch. And if you can say, I believe that adding this, you know, simple open, close, opto isolator switch is a, uh, a safe thing for me to do, and that I can control that when, you know, the power goes out, it's failing safe, go ahead, do it. Um, you can, to it comes down to how much are you willing to put trust in either somebody else or your own putting things together. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I, I like my refrigerator to produce information about its temperature. I do not want it modifying its temperature for me. So, I don't want Listeria. Um, there are a couple of other ones. Um, the Belkin Wemo devices, uh, they just have SSH on them. You, you can get SSH access. There's no root password. You can turn on and off the lights as fast as you want and turn it into a disco. <laughs> okay? Annoy your friends who have uh, epilepsy. I mean, like, don't do that. Yeah. So. Isn't there literally a lawsuit going on about that right now? I don't know. 
something about, yeah, if somebody had epilepsy and somebody knew that and they were like really mm. early dicking with the guy. Oh, yeah, the guy on Twitter. On Twitter. Yeah. Uh, on Twitter, okay. Yes. It was sending... It was sending GIFs with flashing images yeah, to... Yeah, like trying to trigger an epileptic event. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's pretty fucked up. So, these are things that you need to be aware of. We, you know, we, we've been building this out for roughly a month now. Um, we have not done a full in-depth evaluation of its security. Yeah, you know, caveat emptor. Yeah. To give you an idea, um, this is about, like, the fastest that you're going to see... Uh, a lot of Zigbee lights. I'm just sitting here, like, trying to turn it on and off as quickly as possible. Um, but, like, I can still turn off the fixture, and it's not going to do anything. I turn back on the fixture. Like, the, you should have, like, physical safety disconnects if you think that you are a target. Like, lowest tech is the best tech. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we like the sawn off, because we can control it. We know what's going on. Do you know the in-depth logging that's on there? I saw there was a, there was a log down. Um, um, it's mostly just serial. Um, different components can say, like, I saw the sensor, I read the sensor, everything was cool, I'm turning off the sensor now. Um, and if you want more, you can turn it up. You can log it out to a file. You can archive everything that your house sees and thinks and does. A home assistant uh, also has... Oof, um, sorry. Um, also has a history graph. Um, you can turn this off. You can control this. Uh, by default, it saves five days worth of state material. Um, and it logs each component. So whether or not the sun was above the... Um, apparently, we had a small <laughs> event here. Apparently, the sun went backwards for a little while. <laughs> um, you can actually see that the internet went off because this is a, a weather symbol. And it went offline. Um, this is turning on and off the uh, flux adjustment, uh, the light itself. Um, you can even do data logging, so integer, integer values. Uh, anything that has the same um, uh, unit, it will try and keep a log of like units. But you can so. also break that out to different devices. So let's say you've got uh, humidity sensors. You can have humidity for like two parts of one part of your house or a bun and then a bunch of your plants because humidity in plants, uh, you know, the humidity in the air and the plant humidity is going to be a different type of humidity. Same with the laundry room. Exactly. Right. Running the dryer and humidity is going to go up. That's not necessarily a problem. Yeah. No. But and you want to know maybe. If you have something. It's open my garage. I mean, something might be leaking. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, in the configuration for the uh, record keeping, you can explicitly tell it, do not record like this particular thing. Like I would turn off this and this because I don't need to know what the weather was uh, a week ago, nor do I need to know that my configuration broke. Um, well, maybe you need to know that. Maybe I might but... need to know that, but I don't need to have it logged. Um, there is also a journal that you can have it keep, which says when things went on and off, when, uh, whether or not Home Assistant was restarted, or whether or not the sun has set, which apparently the sun set, and then magically came back up. Um, and this lasts for about a, a week. Um, you can set how many days of retention uh, their default is, again, five. I set it, like, two. Um, if you believe that, like, something terrible has been logged, it's just an SQL database. Blow away the file. Blow away. That. And boom. All of your history is gone. Um, you can have it do text-to-speech stuff. There's a cool demo that you can uh, put the... Uh, Google Voice Hat on top of it, and it will do conversation stuff with you back and forth um, via text to speech. Um, you can have this again integrated into Alexa if you really want to, um, and if you integrate it into other systems, they might be keep keeping track of when you're hitting it, what you're doing with it, etc. So, any third-party uh, things or even 
whatever hub you use might be uh, taking care of tracking where you are, what you've been doing with it, etc. But it could, it could be a security win because you can actually compare to some of the out of the box products, you can actually see what mistake is basically. Yes, right. And ultimately, it's written in Python, it's on GitHub. Pull down the sources, investigate, make, contribute to it. Like, if there's something that you want to see it do and it doesn't, yeah. You can write your own module for it. I'm actually working on a thing to do a uh, visible wake-up alarm in my, in my bedroom. You know, turn on the light at this time and to a very low light and then increase the temperature or increase in uh, brightness, brightness over time. Um, you know, there's, if you want to build out that functionality, go for it. And then, you know, maybe contribute it back because maybe other people also would like this. And again, since um, custom module is just a chunk of Python, all you have, if there's somebody else that's done something that's like, oh yeah, I need that, you can just drop it in your own configuration and off you go. You set it up and it should work just out of the box. Um, the weird part about uh, Home Assistant is that it does automatically download any dependencies. Like if you import some random library and you say, yeah, I need this library off of pip, it will happily go, cool, you loaded that. Hold on, I'm going to go fetch all those things from pip. Just this in the background. caused us a bit of consternation yesterday as we're setting this up. It's like, why won't the hub connect? Why won't, why won't it read the gateway? It's like, oh, hang on. Let me go run Ethernet from our main network over to this thing because this is completely detached. We've been running this entirely in its own little walled garden of not having internet for the um, purpose of this demo. So I had to kind of yeah. reintegrate it to the internet for a bit. Um, you don't need to remember that Home Assistant, uh, the, if you have an old version of the uh, SD card image for Home Assistant, don't worry, when you uh, toss onto an SD card, first boot, it actually pulls down the whole uh, Home Assistant stable binary uh, and all its dependencies from pip automatically on first boot. Um, there is an updater. Uh, there's a new version about every three to four weeks now. Uh, they're consistently adding new features, um, fixing old bugs, and it gives you a notification saying, hey, there's an update. On Haspian, it says, you know, you've got to go in and run a shell script that says, hey, yeah, download the new version. Otherwise, on the Docker version, it's like, yeah, we're just restarting the Docker instance, repulling it, and off we go. So, any other questions? Looks like we're good. Yeah. Thanks Thank for coming out, guys.